college education and a rewarding career. They're yours when you become a cadet at the Air Force Academy. The Academy is looking for qualified young men to become leaders of tomorrow's Air Force. You'll receive four years of higher education and a commission in the United States Air Force. If you're a high school senior right now, it'll pay you to check it out. Call the Academy liaison officer at an air base near you. Brad. Johnny Dollar. New York Police Department calling. Mr. Dollar, will you accept the charges? Uh, yeah, put them on. Just a moment, please. Granny, with your call to Hartford, Connecticut. Go ahead. Hello, Dollar. That's right. This is Sergeant Papage, robbery. I have a notation here. You're the one to contact in the case that came up. Allied Adjustment Bureau? Oh, I've done a lot of work for him. What's it about, Sergeant? Well, we've recovered a mink coat you were looking for about six months ago. Oh? Yeah, stolen from a party named Jacoby in Rochester. The Jacobys are in Europe right now, but the furrier has already identified it as the one he sold to him. Jacoby? Rochester? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. It was insured for $5,000. There's some other things taken in the same hall. A watch, rings, bracelets? That's the job. So far, we just have the coat and the girl who was wearing it. What did she say? Nothing. So far, she's got a couple of bullet holes in her. Maybe I better get down there, Sergeant. Room 212, Sergeant Papage. All right. Hi, fellas. Care to join me in a quick look at the past? Okay, here goes. Back around 1890, Charles Dudley Warner, who was editor of the Hartford Current, wrote in an editorial, Everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. Well, maybe no one did in 1890, but someone definitely has since then. Our United States weatherman. He's quite a busy gentleman who works for the Department of Commerce. His job is to read thermometers, barometers, anemometers, and other assorted meters, which forecast weather conditions so the rest of us will know what to plan or what not to plan. Like hanging out the wash or going to a baseball game. Information about weather conditions is also given to aircraft pilots and ship captains so they can plan their flights or cruises accordingly. Of course, they need more than just weather data, and the Commerce Department gives them what they need. For the pilots, the department issues aviation charts and maps and sees to it that air markers are laid out so that the pilots can find their way easily and safely. For the ship captains, the Commerce Department issues nautical charts and tide tables to indicate when and where it will be safe to navigate their ships. The department also inspects the ships to see that they're in perfect operating condition and issues licenses for the operating of the ships. So the next time you look up at the sky and wonder what kind of a day it's going to be, the thought might also cross your mind that many lives and valuable cargo carried by American planes and ships are depending on the United States weatherman who is also looking at the sky. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Allied Adjustment Bureau, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Rochester theft matter. Account item one, $1.65. Person to person collect call from Sergeant Papish, New York Police Department. Item two, $32.56. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City after clearing authority to resume on the Jacoby case. It had been stalemated six months before when the Rochester police and I were unable to recover any part of the item stolen from the Jacoby residence. I arrived in New York at 135, dropped my bags off at the New Weston, then went directly to the Metropolitan Police Station. if you could help me. I'm looking for Sergeant Papish. I'm Papish. Oh, Johnny Dollar, Sergeant. Oh. Thanks for coming down, Now I have a chair. Oh, thanks. Your mink coat's in the crime lab. They're looking it over. Uh-huh. They still haven't found out much about the girl who was wearing it. What's her name? Uh, just Jane Doe for now. We didn't have her prints on file here, but we're waiting to hear from Washington now. She's been unconscious ever since we picked her up. Pretty bad shape. Well, what exactly happened? 
I came in as a complaint about uh, three this morning. A woman over on 57th Street telephoned about a disturbance. A prowl car went over to the address and found this girl lying in the entrance to the apartment house wearing the mink coat. She'd been shot twice. Uh-huh. No one in the apartment house seemed to know her or had ever seen her before. We asked about the neighborhood. No dice. But we did find out how she got there. Huh? The lady across the street said she saw a man drive up sometime after midnight and unload the girl from his car. She uh, was able to give us a fair description of the car and the man. Yeah. Thanks. But nothing definite. No license number or anything like that. Could be any car and any man, from what she said. Got an APB out, of course. Was there a purse or anything? Nothing. The dress she was wearing came from a store downtown. Hundreds just like it. The coat was the only item that might have helped, and it turned up listed in the stolen property file. How about jewelry? Small diamond ring on her little finger. When I looked over the list of things taken in that Jacoby robbery, it doesn't fit any of those. Look at it if you want to. I'll take your word for it. I suppose the insurance company paid off the claim. Yeah, the whole thing. Well, at least we have the coat back for you. Maybe we'll get a line on the other things when this girl regains consciousness. If she does. Pretty bad, is it? Yeah. Nice looking girl, too. Only about 25 or so. Excuse me. Sir. Robbery, Sergeant Fabish. Oh, let me get it down here. Two thirteen West. Right. Okay, see you there. Bye. She's got an answer from Washington. They able to identify the girl? Yeah, address and all. She had a postal savings once. Name's Eileen Madden. You mind if I go with you? Come on. Maybe you'll get back all of your loot. I accompanied Sergeant Papish to the address for Eileen Madden. Turned out to be a fairly nice apartment in a fairly nice neighborhood. By the time we arrived there, a full crew of technicians were at work giving the place a complete check. Sergeant Papish introduced me to a tall, heavy set man. This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company, Walt. Sergeant Walter. Hi. How are you, Sergeant? Oh, fine. I'm afraid we haven't done any good for you so far. I haven't found anything here to go with that mink coat. Oh, have you talked to anybody around here yet? Just getting started on it. The lady who lives across the hall might be able to help us. Where is she? In there. Her name's Ethel Stromberg. Mrs. Okay. I'll think it here. All right. Uh, are you Mrs. Stromberg? Yes, I am. I'm Sergeant Papers. This is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? How do you do? How is poor Eileen? Not very good, Mrs. Stromberg. She's still unconscious. Oh, dear, that's terrible. Just a terrible thing. Where is she? I'd like to go see her if it's possible. She's at the police emergency hospital right now, Mrs. Stromberg. I'll have them phone you when she can see people. Well, thank you. What an awful thing. How did that happen? What's that all about? Uh, maybe you can tell us something about her, Mrs. Stromberg. Where she worked, how she lived, what people she knew. Oh, dear. How long have you known her? Well, I moved in here about five months ago. I met her for the very first day. Mm-hmm. Nice girl? Oh, yes, very nice, very nice girl. Quiet, to mind at her own business. Do you know where we can contact the family? No, I can't help you there, Sergeant. I, I know they live somewhere in California, but that's about all... She talks about them now and then. How about her friends here in town? What about them? Did she talk about any of her friends to you? What do you mean? Well, she's a pretty girl, young, boyfriends, maybe. Yes, she did talk about them now and then. You suppose one of them had something to do? Mrs. Stromberg, I mean Madden was dumped from a convertible last night after she'd been shot. A witness described the car as possibly blue or black in color, white top, white sidewalls. She said it was a late model Cadillac, a Buick. Do you know if any of Miss Madden's friends drove a car that comes near that description at all? Well, yes. Yes, I saw him pick her up tonight. I was just coming home. I saw who pick her up, Mrs. Stromberg? A man she called Bill. Bill who? I really don't know his last name. She didn't introduce me to him. But she talks about him. He drove a black Cadillac. Can you tell us what he looks like? Well, he seems very tall. As tall as Sergeant Papish here? So about your height, very nice looking. He seems quite big. Hopsy, sort of. Very nicely dressed, too. What color was his hair? 
I don't know. He always was. I, I think it was dark, though. His eyes? I don't know. About uh, how old, would you say? Oh, I'm not good at this, but uh, I say between 30 and 35. Mm, it seems to fit what we have from the witness. Yeah. Uh, this Bill, would you say he had money? Oh, yes, I would say so. He drove that nice big convertible. He always dressed so nice. And he gave Eileen for it nice things. Do you know if he ever gave her any jewelry? I don't know. I don't think so. Eileen usually run across the hall and show me when he sent her something nice. I don't remember her ever showing me any jewelry. I just talked to the hospital. How is she? Just coming around. I think you'd better go over there and talk to her if you're gonna. Is she bad? I think she's dying, Mrs. Tomber. Anything, Doctor? No. You no, might have to wait a little while for her to come around. I see. I'll tell you both. That's what you have to know quick. Two minutes is about all I can give you with it. Sure enough. Oh, better put your cigarettes in there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, boys. Okay, boy. Eileen Madden? Is Eileen Madden your name? Yes. You're seriously hurt, Miss Madden. Can you tell us how it happened? Miss Madden? No. Bill shot you? Yes. What's Bill's name? Where can we find him? the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Eileen Madden died at 3.35 in the afternoon without giving us the full name of the man who shot her the night before. I stayed with Sergeant Papish and Sergeant Walters as they continued their investigation of her death and the appearance of the mink coat covered in policy number 27M55567 issued to Roland J. Jacoby, Rochester, New York. The apartment where she had lived yielded some information. Here it is. Letters from Robert J. Madden in Riverside, California. Looks like a father. Okay, we'd better notify him. This might be the best lead. What's that? This picture. Found in one of her closets. Let's see. Hmm. Darling. Oh, thanks. Love, Bill. You loved her, all right. Yeah. Anybody identified this yet? And Mrs. Stromberg's supposed to be here right now. What time are you? Oh, uh, half past. She said she'd be here at six. Anything on the bullets? They didn't check with anything in our lab. Ballistic says it was an Army 45. Bill 1911 model. Pretty good gun for killing. What gun is it? Oh, I got the wrong room at first. Oh, come in, Mrs. Sonberg. You remember Sergeant Papish and Mr. Dollar? Yes. Do I have to answer more questions? Not many more. Oh, I'm just all worn out. I can't get over this terrible thing happening to Eileen. Did you get in touch with her family? Business office is doing it right now. Oh, dear. What a terrible, terrible thing. Mrs. Sonberg. 
Have you ever seen this man before? Oh, yes. That's good. The man Eileen's been going with? Yes. The man who drives the black Cadillac convertible? Yes, that's him. But did he do this terrible thing? It looks that way, Mrs. Stromberg. Oh, dear, dear. <clears throat> Sergeant Pavish. Eileen Madden never mentioned to you that she had been married? Why, no. She never did. Was she? And the state of New York in 1951 just found out from vitals. Divorced? Yeah. Her ex-husband's name is Bill. Bill Powers. <laughs> Sergeant Papish, this is Mr. Dollar. Uh, how do you do? What's the matter? May we come inside, Mr. Powers? Sure. Well, yeah. what's this all about? Do you know a woman named Eileen Madden, Mr. Powers? Yeah, sure. We were married once. Why? Eileen Madden was shot to death last night, Mr. Powers. Eileen? Yes. Are you sure? I... We checked her prints. Oh. Uh. Shot? Yes. What, what happened? I, well, how, how could a thing like that happen? That's what we're trying to find out, Mr. Powers. I, I can't believe it. I am dead. Have you seen her lately? Yeah, I, I saw her last week. We had a drink together. Are you sure it's Eileen? We'd make sure before we came around with news like this. <laughs> Mr. Dollar represents an insurance company, Mr. Powers. Miss Madden was wearing a stolen coat when we found her. Stolen coat? Yes, a stolen mink coat. Was uh, she ever in trouble anywhere? I don't care what she was wearing. I didn't never steal anything. She was a fine girl, a wonderful girl. I was a fool to ever let our marriage go on the rock. Can you come with us, Mr. Powers? Where? We need a positive identification. Sure. Sure, Sergeant. I'll be right. Oh, the smoke. Thanks. Well, he isn't the bird in the picture. No. Did you see the car in the driveway? Yeah. 51 Caddy Black Convertible. to the city morgue with the ex-husband of Eileen Madden, we tried to get more information from him regarding her activities up to the time of her death. But power seemed so distraught that he could only speak of their short marriage and the reason it ended. It was an old and especially sad story of a man who couldn't provide well enough for a beautiful wife. However, once he'd seen her body at the morgue and identified it, he seemed to get better control of himself. We all walked across the street for coffee. I hope you get whoever did this, Sergeant. I hope you get him fast. We sure want to, Mr. Powers. Why would anybody do that to Eileen? Why? Maybe you can help us answer that. Oh, you're just interested in that coat you say she was wearing. Well, mister, I don't believe she was wearing a stolen coat. What do you think of that? I'm just looking for the facts, Mr. Powers. I'd like to prove what you just said as badly as you'd like to have it proved. But we have to start somewhere. You can understand that. I suppose so. You told us you saw her last week for a drink. That's right. Have you been seeing her right along? Yeah, sure. Did you know that she's been going with somebody else? Sure. Then uh, you know Bill? Bill Chambers? Yeah. But if I, I, I don't know him, but she talked about him on the line. Is this, uh, this Bill Chambers, Mr. Power? Yeah. yeah. That's him. I thought you knew You're sure this is him? I'm sure. This picture was in her place. I went there one day and saw it and asked her who he was. He told me all about him. What did she tell you about him? Why, she said she was going with him. She she told me that he wanted to marry her. Said he had lots of money. Did she tell you where he worked? No. Well, 
of what kind of work he does. No. Do you know how we can get in touch with him? No, I don't know that either. Say, do you think he might have done this to her? We'd like to talk to him. I, I know she's been going with him for a few months, but she told me. And you've been seeing her the same time she was seeing Chambers? Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. She didn't want to marry him. You mean me again. You know what kind of a car Chambers drives? Cadillac. Thought you never met him. Well, she told me about his car. <laughs> it's another thing. I went out and bought one myself. I thought it might do me some good with it. Mm-hmm. Were you at home last night? Yeah. Can you prove it? Yeah. <laughs> I was home. She was out getting killed. The name William Chambers was checked through the New York police files. They listed 24 persons who more or less fit his general description. It took two days to locate and talk with all of them. Neither Mrs. Stromberg nor the witness who had seen the body dumped from the car could identify any of them. An all-points bulletin regarding the suspect and his car had been issued as soon as we learned his name. Same results. Nothing. On the third day, the pawn shop detail turned up two more items that had been taken in the Jacoby robbery. There they are. Huh. Watch and ring. Jacoby stuff? Case numbers on the watch checkout. The ring's engraved. Where'd they wind up? Shop on 3rd Street. The proprietor says it was sold yesterday. man who sold them signed the Bible, James of Jennion. How about his description? Chris Chambers down the line. Well, at least he was still in town yesterday. Yeah, but the stuff's been on the hot seat for a long time. If he's had any experience at all, he knew he was taking a chance trying to unload it. Probably trying to raise cash to get out of town. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> Give an address on Polk Street, a vacant lot. If he keeps on trying to unload it, I'll have all the loot back. If he keeps on trying, we'll keep on trying. I well, found his car. Where? His car a lot in the Bronx. He sold it at 10 o'clock this morning. At the used car lot, we learned that a man answering the description of William Chambers had driven in that morning and offered a black 51 Cadillac convertible for sale. The used car lot manager had finally settled on a price and made out a check. He reported the man had seemed extremely nervous and anxious to make a quick deal. The car was impounded and examined. A full set of fingerprints on the steering wheel and dashboard gave us a positive identification of William Chambers. William Carlson, alias William Carls, William Charles, Walter Cameron, male, Caucasian, age 33, 178-61. Let's see, 14 arrests, two convictions, both car theft. Quite a lad. Aren't they all? <laughs> Doesn't look like a killer, though, does he? I don't know. What's a killer supposed to look like? The search to locate William Carlson, alias William Chambers, extended to all parts of the city. The associates and relatives listed in his criminal file were contacted and questioned. All of them denied having any knowledge of his whereabouts. In the meantime, two more pieces of stolen property connected with the Jacoby theft were recovered by the pawn shop detail. Each of the pawn shop proprietors identified the mugshot of the wanted man. He used different names in each instance. The handwriting was the same. Each address had to be checked out. I went with Sergeant Papish to the one he had given on 78th Street. It was not a vacant lot. Hello? Hello. We're looking for William Courtney. You found him? Huh? Cops? Yeah. Morning. Oh, still. I'm clean. Check me through the Bible book yesterday? Yeah. Your name's Carlson, isn't it? William Carlson? Yep. We've been looking a long time for you. I know. Yesterday, I decided I'd let you find him. I get my right address. You want to get your hat? Sure. Look, I didn't mean to kill Eileen. I didn't mean to at all. I want you to know that. Let's talk about it downtown. No. No, we won't. 
I'm not talking to anybody downtown. I'm talking to you two right now, and that's it. You better listen. Okay. I've been doing pretty good with these house jobs. Real good. Enough to buy myself a nice car, get some clothes, get around a little bit. I work all along. I met her. I liked her. I wanted to marry her. I did. I, re- I really did. We went out the other night, and I gave her the mink coat for a present. I thought that'd sent you. She didn't want to take it. She told me she was going to marry some guy she'd been married to before. I thought I have it. That's all? That's all. That's it, mister. I could have run. Sold my car. Getting rid of a lot of odds and ends I have around. I decided not to, after all. I don't want to run. Okay, let's get with it. And remember, I let you get me. I wrote my address right down where I knew you'd check it out. Okay. And there's no more talking. You two got it all straight. What's the matter with you, anyway? You got it all? I mean, about everything? I... Yeah, I got it. Okay. Hey, wait a minute. You guys are too late. I... I took it when I heard you knock on the door. Where's the phone? Too late, I tell you. It's in my stomach now. Too late. Not for me, brother. I handle plenty of babies, just like you. Too late. Grab him, Nick. Too late. No. Shut up. This is a sand trial, baby. Sergeant Papish had handled attempted suicides. A lot of them. And in the five minutes before the arrival of the emergency ambulance, he managed to force William Carlson to take an antidote that saved his life. The remainder of the Jacoby theft items were found in and around the apartment of the suspect along with other stolen property listed with the New York police. All of the articles on the enclosed list have been impounded and will be available following the trial of William Carlson. Expense account item three, hotel and board while in New York, $88.65. Item four, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $155.42. Remarks... Please file a copy of the above report for the information of William Powers in regard to his ex-wife, Eileen Madden. I think this is what he wanted. Well, that's it. Here is truly Johnny Dollar. You know, many great men have attained the highest office in our land... The Presidency of the United States. Can you guess the name of this man? In 1770, as one of the leading lawyers in Massachusetts, he defended the British soldiers who fired on civilians during the so-called Boston Massacre. His four years as president were perhaps the stormiest in our history as he fought to keep America out of a war with France. But an official war against France brought George Washington out of retirement as commander of the army and gave birth to the phrase, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. If you don't have his name by now, here are two more clues. During his presidency, Washington became the national capital, and the 11th Amendment was adopted. Who was he? John Adams, second president of the United States. His life is part of your American heritage. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, who stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, John McIntyre, Jim Nusser, Jeanette Nolan, Victor Perrin, and Bill Johnstone. Tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, John McIntyre, Jim Nusser, Jeanette Nolan, Victor Perrin, and Bill Johnstone. 